Welcome to Across Africa, our weekly roundup of stories from across the continent. I'm Georgia Calvin Smith, and coming up, new documents seen by France 24 suggest that orders not to arrest those responsible for the Rwandan genocide in 1994 came straight from the Elysee and against the recommendation of the French Foreign Office. Also, for the first time in its history, Burkina Faso is struggling to deal with widespread internal displacement. As extremists have become more active in the country, more than 100,000 people have been forced from their homes. Most have fled this year. And more than 35,000 people came together for the sixth Amani Festival in Goma, DR Congo. The region's seen decades of trouble, and organizers of the event hope music and dance can help heal rifts caused by violence and instability. But first, France 24's obtained new documents about the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. They appear to show that there were disagreements between France's Elysee Palace and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs about whether or not to arrest those responsible for the mass killing of Tutsis. Around 800,000 people were slaughtered in less than 100 days. This report by Michael Stenke and Emeline marot Andrew. In July 1994, the members of the Rwandan interim government fled the capital Kigali and entered Congo, which was then called Zaire. The members of that government were Hutu extremists who were responsible for the genocide of the Tutsis. On the 15th of July, they were in Siangugu in the humanitarian area controlled by the French army. The French ambassador in Kigali warned Paris, here is his diplomatic cable. We know that the authorities played an important role in the genocide. Despite the difficulties, we do not have any other choice but to stop them. That same day, the headline of a Reuters article was Paris ready to arrest Rwandan government members. Hubert Vedrine, a top official from the Elysee Palace, wrote this next to the headline. Read by the president, this is not what was said in the prime minister's office. The decision not to arrest them was taken at the highest level. I don't see how France at the time could have done something because there was no clear mandate from the Security Council. It would have been different if the Security Council's mandate had said there will be both a humanitarian operation and also one to arrest those who we are certain were responsible for what happened. The United Nations mandate was a humanitarian one, not a judicial one. It was not the armed wing of a criminal court. Jacques Langsad, the head of the French army under President François Mitterrand, said France had no choice but to remain neutral. We did not have the power to arrest people who are now considered to have taken part in the genocide. To look after those who committed the genocide was not our problem. I mean, we did not have that right. But the French Foreign Ministry disagreed at the time, according to this journalist who's written books on the topic. The French ambassador, Yannick Gérard, who is on the ground, who is on the political side, not on the military side, is pushing Paris and the French army to intervene, to stop those who committed the genocide and arrest them. In Paris, around that time, the French foreign minister, Alain Juppé, promised that those responsible for the genocide would be arrested. But in the end, their evacuation was organized and they were not arrested. Subsequently, 17 of the interim government's 21 members were charged with genocide by the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. For the first time in its history, Burkina Faso is facing mass internal displacement. A new UN report estimates that factional fighting and attacks by militant extremists have forced around 100,000 people from their homes. Most have fled within the last two months alone. Our team sent us this report. Huh? Fubei's camp for the internally displaced is in the heart of the bush, 150 kilometers from Ouagadougou. About 2,500 people live here. Most fled their homes after men raided their villages. Hassanu, a father of six, managed to escape with his family. The horrific memories of the violence still haunt him. I was at home when I heard shots. They burned the markets, shops and bars. They ransacked everything and killed people. I saw 12 people die. 
We didn't have time to take our things. We escaped. Aminata was pregnant when she fled and gave birth in the camp a week ago. For now, at least 10 other women are due to deliver their babies here. To cope with an ever-increasing population, food is carefully rationed in the camp. Everyone gets 400 grams of cereals a day, but supplies are running low. We have food stores that have a capacity of 500 tonnes because we believe that's what we need to have at all times. Behind us we have no more than 10 tonnes. There is a huge need to stock food in the stores to help support these displaced people. Another camp has been erected about 30 kilometres away. Around 300 children live here at the Barcelogo site. Staff offer all the support they can, but many kids have been deeply traumatised. He told me that he doesn't want to go back to Yirugu anymore because that's where his dad was killed. I try to cheer them up, to keep them busy so they can forget about their experiences. The UN says about 1,000 people have fled their homes every day of 2019. Across Burkina Faso, that comes to about 60,000 internally displaced people this year alone. The overall number of IDPs is estimated at around 100,000. In DR Congo, years of conflict, unrest and violence around the eastern city of Goma have fed into mistrust between locals and the army. In a bid to tackle the discord and division, organisers of the Imani Festival hope that music can help rebuild frayed ties. Ronya Harrington reports from Goma. In streets which usually swing to rumba, the French band Mortal Combo have brought a new sound. And when they take to the festival stage, the band will also have some new members. They've spent two weeks in Goma training Congolese musicians to play brass instruments. With a mixed group of civilians playing alongside members of the police and the military, some had their reservations at first. It's really amazing that we can spend more than two or three days alongside the police and military. It's amazing and without fighting with each other, without having any problems. It's so surprising. Personally, I'm afraid of these people. I'm really afraid of them. But here they've proved me wrong. I said to myself, they're not all bad. The French trainers visiting the DRC for the first time have seen a sense of trust begin to emerge during the workshop. At lunchtime, you had the military eating alongside civilians, police eating next to others. I think that's a sign. At the beginning, it was almost corporate, military with military, police with police, civilians with civilians. Now I think there's much more of a mix. Many members of the police and army in this region have fought wars and rebellions for years, some of them against their own people. But they say, after making war, you must know how to make peace. Everywhere in the world, after a war, you have to call all of the people. You have to be united. People have to sing and dance to show that we are united. On the festival stage, the army and police will play in uniform alongside civilians for the first time, a symbolic gesture for the people of Goma. A forbidden Moroccan film that had only ever been seen by a handful of people was finally enjoyed freely by audiences when it was screened at the Berlin International Film Festival this month. Banned in 1974, About Some Meaningless Events was the first feature film of Mustafa Dekawi. The 75-year-old, who's considered one of Morocco's greatest directors, was deeply moved at finally being able to share his work. <laughs> Those times occurred on the set of the film about some meaningless event. A feature film shot, then edited in Casablanca, which was banned from being shown or exported under the reign of King Hassan II. These photos, newspaper clippings and archive footage evoke strong memories for director Mustafa Dakawi. This film collective, which brought together musicians, poets, painters and writers, was deemed inappropriate for Morocco at the time. 
Mustafa Dekawi also says he was criticised for not having shown a portrait of King Hassan II once in his film. And he said that the film takes place in shabby locations and only features bad people. So you weren't exactly going to put the picture of the sovereign into that world, were you? That's what you said. At the time, we felt it was really unfair and baseless. And there was also a kind of psychosis, because we weren't safe from a simple policeman passing by and saying, show us your papers. It was really a terrible time. Mustafa Dakawi and his team dared to film in the streets of the poor areas of Casablanca. Characters are brought back to life in the port, cafes and bars like the Capitol, which has since closed down. Barely seen until now, the film is now due to get exposure after its first showing at the International Festival of Berlin, the result of two years of hard, painstaking restoration work. We cleaned it up image by image, so that meant removing every scratch, hole or film defect, but also always respecting the dignity of the film and trying to restore it to what it was like when it was shot and edited by the director. The film will finally reach a Moroccan audience in March at the Tangiers Festival. For Mustafa Dakawi, that alone is a miracle. Well, that's it for Across Africa for this week, but thanks very much for joining us, and do so again if you can. Take care.